Bianca Stacy, a renowned UX designer at Amazon, has significantly impacted mobile app design with her user-focused and data-driven approach. Beyond her tech achievements, she mentors emerging talents and shares her expertise widely. This interview offers a unique opportunity to glean insights from a leading figure in UX design and entrepreneurship. Bianca's blend of technical skill and entrepreneurial spirit provides valuable lessons for anyone interested in the intersection of technology, design, and business. Bianca, thank you so much for being here on Tech is New Black. Wow, did you write that? No, ChatGPT did. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I refined it. I told Chad GBT, I said, hey, make it sound more epic. Then it made it sound like it was like an intro to a movie. I said, okay, that's too much. I said, chill out. <laughs> and then I said, hey, dumb it down. You know, most people have, I think, like a fourth grade reading level. <laughs> oh, or, they, or they said it's better when you write something at a fourth grade reading level because mm. it captures more people. Yeah. But when I was reading it, it sounded like a child wrote it. It was like, you know, instead <laughs> of saying renowned UX designers, like a cool UX, I was like, okay, no, nah, we ain't doing this. Uh, so, yeah, so I did a little bit of refining but other than that chat did it okay yeah, yeah. yeah i love that you use ai yeah oh yeah, yeah definitely yeah, i love that <laughs> oh yeah yeah big time <laughs> i look so really excited about this conversation uh, very happy that you were able to make it out here really appreciate you so much uh for making the time to come out mm -hmm. and when we connected uh when i first noticed you it was because a mutual friend of ours mm -hmm. had posted you and you know she's been killing it doing her thing at amazon as well and I was like, yo, I was like, okay, who is this? I checked you out. I saw you. So I was like, yo, like she's doing some fire things. And I was like, especially <laughs> her being an entrepreneur as well as working in the tech space. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we, we ended up connecting, having a conversation. And I'm going to share some. Make sure y'all stick around to the end because I'm actually <laughs> going to share something about when we first connected. Something that's going to kind of really be embarrassing on my part. But is really cool in terms of what it is she's doing. And I really think it would be incredibly beneficial to other business owners that want to maintain your professional brand, professional integrity, mm -hmm. but also be able to work on growing a business as well. So, um, so definitely stick around for that. And also, right away off the top, make sure y'all go ahead and subscribe. Over 70% of y'all, even though we're at like 130,000 subscribers around that, 70% of y'all that watch our content are not subscribed. So make sure you subscribe, hit the like button because it helps the algorithm share this video, this conversation with more people. And you know, we never ask anybody for money or anything. Only thing we ask is that if you wanna pay us back, just hit a like, show love, so that way this video can be shared with other people and be a blessing to them as well. But we got a lot of great things to talk about. Very excited about this conversation. And so you ready to get into it? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's go. All right, so now most people today try to do as minimum as possible to get a job in tech. Mm -hmm. Some people try to do nothing at all. Mm -hmm. They try to avoid any type of education, any type of boot camp. They'll try to find a, a $20 certification <laughs> thing they could find online to study something. And so they, they try to avoid work to get in tech. Mm -hmm. But your story is pretty interesting because you were already in tech mm -hmm. and you did it. You still did a tech boot camp. Yeah. And so my question is, all right, so how did you get started initially in tech and why did you still later on choose to do a tech boot camp? So I'm really curious about that. Yeah. So I got into tech. Um, in a very di different capacity okay. than I am now. So yeah. my first entry into tech was a little bit of an administrative job mm -hmm. um, for GroupMe. I don't know if you remember GroupMe, the yeah. messaging app. Um, so I worked for the founders in sort of like a program manager, office manager capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and they were doing some cool stuff back then. They yeah. were just sort of like novel and everyone was using them. Um, they got bought out by Skype. And then Skype got bought out by Microsoft. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know Skype bought I'm like, dang, Skype even had money to buy GroupMe at that time. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that really changed the office dynamic a lot. Yeah. Because um, all of a sudden, you know, you're a part of Microsoft. And so you have a lot more resources. Yeah. So we were doing a lot more fun things like hackathons. Um, we were doing design collaborations and things mm -hmm. like that. But I wasn't a designer then. Yeah. So I always wanted to be in design, just yeah. not knowing really had a break into design. So I was sort of going to the meetings, being a fly on the wall, just being quiet, just observing, <laughs> just, yeah. just kind of there in the background. Um, and then one day I was just like, why am I not just going for it? Yeah. Like at that moment I decided to take my life out of the drafts folder mm -hmm. and actually do something with myself. So I went back to school, which mm -hmm. was general assembly. Mm -hmm. um, I had to quit and be unemployed. It sucked. <laughs> why did you, 
I don't remember if we talked about this offline. Mm. Why did you have to quit uh, when doing General Assembly? Was it because of the, the demand for General Assembly, like in terms of the work you had to do? Well, yeah. So the work was demanding, but also I wanted to do the full-time program oh, yeah. so I could get certified. Mm -hmm. And so in order to do that, you have to be there 9 to 6 or 9 to 7 p.m. every single day. Yeah. And you can't really have a job. It's just impossible. Man. Yeah. yeah. So, so I quit. And um, I did that for three months. Mm -hmm. Three months flew by, and then I found myself in the job market as a new designer, not knowing how to get a job mm -hmm. at all in design. Man. Just sort of being out there, just trying to figure it out. Um, and so what I did was work for the Holocaust Museum for free. So the Holocaust Museum in DC, mm -hmm. they had a project. Um, I knew it was for free, so I was okay with that. But yeah. I was able to sort of build up the beginning of a portfolio, mm -hmm. a design portfolio for uh, digital spaces. Mm -hmm. So I did that and was able to launch a few things on their site and someone noticed. And so that's all you really need is someone to notice you. Yeah. Um, and then it was um, after that, a small transportation company outside of Baltimore that I worked for. So they picked me up as a fresh designer out of school, not knowing anything and literally mm -hmm. not knowing anything. Um, they paid me well, they treated me well. It was a great environment, but I needed more growth mm -hmm. and I realized in order to get growth, you just kind of have to move around. Yeah. Um, so then I went to Under Armour and um, that was great, but I didn't really jive with the culture as well. So Under Armour meaning like the actual fashion clothing yeah. Under Armour. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you were doing a design, a, a technical design job for Under Armour. Yes. Okay, yes. cool. Yeah. So I was designing um, like ways you can shop for a complete outfit online. So um, just features that help you pick an outfit, pick a, like a running style, and then we would match sort of your style with clothes. Yeah. Um, so I designed that feature for them. Um, they launched it, but I'm not sure if they still have it around. Mm -hmm. But through that, um, I got noticed by Amazon. Yeah. And that was it. That was history. <laughs> that is so cool. That is fire. I, I wonder, it is a sidebar question, because I... I I hear about the job, and it's funny. I was thinking about what you were saying that you were watching the the designers mm. when you uh, before when you were uh, working um, under under Microsoft, but with GroupMe, how you were like a fly on the wall. I had that that picture image of Squidward watching SpongeBob <laughs> and Patrick like frolicking around, <laughs> like you right. you looking like watching them. Yeah. And so that's a, just a, a silly uh, sidebar, but yeah. But one thing I wonder: so if someone's interested in UX design. And let's say they're like myself. I am not good at designing. Like I'm, in, in terms of making things, I can look at something and say that's ugly. But <laughs> okay. in terms of saying what I, what it needs to look like to be cool, I'm not that person. I'll just be like, no, that's ugly. That's stupid. Like, no, fix it. It's like, fix it how? I don't know. Just make it not make it le le less ugly. <laughs> and so, someone that that's interested in UX design, do they need to already have a knack or a bit of a skill set for knowing what something is, should look like, or is usually if they do a quality UX design uh, school or boot camp, mm. do they help coaching in that? So you, you don't have to have an eye for design. You just, you have to be willing to evolve yeah. and you have to be willing to learn pretty quickly. So UX design is more about systems and how they work and how mm -hmm. it functions. Um, and then you're layering UI on top of that. So okay. sometimes you get to design the UI as well, or sometimes yeah. you're not. Sometimes you're just doing strictly the experience of the product. You know, I'm sorry, we're, we're throwing terms around and, and yeah. I, I'm not being uh, considerate to the to the our varying audience. Um, mm -hmm. There are people listening and watching that could could even teach us about like <laughs> deeper things about uh, UI and UX. Well, maybe not you, but definitely me. Uh, <laughs> but then there are a lot of people that they're hearing UX, UI. And obviously, you know, people try to use them interchangeably like they're the same thing. Yeah. Can you explain in a very basic way, giving an example, what is UI versus what is UX? So UI is what you're going to see on the screen. Okay. That's it. It's very simple. UX is how you maneuver through that product. Okay. So... Is there a point where there's a friction um, area where let's say you're shopping and you put two things in your cart and one thing drops? Yeah, it just I don't know doesn't what. show up or something. Yeah, so that, that's a point of friction, right? Okay. So UX is like the entire experience of the product, whereas the UI is just strictly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's dope. <laughs> All right, so now you mentioned that you ended up at Amazon, which you're, yeah. you're there now. But you told me offline that you actually bombed, <laughs> you bombed your interview with them and not bombed in a way where it was bad, but 
it was passable enough to where they said, oh, okay, cool, we're still going to, you know, we'll still make it work. Yeah. But it was in a way to where they said, hey, you know what? This is great. We'll keep your information. Right. And, um, yeah, good luck, you know. Right. <laughs> but later on, they spent the block. And yep. you still ended up with Amazon. Mm-hmm. Like, how did that happen? Um, yeah, so they recycled me. Okay. I, I did not perform well the first interview, so yeah. I got recycled based on a cultural fit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what happened in the first interview was I wasn't showing my impact as strongly as I could have throughout my portfolio. Mm. So that's a big thing that designers that are coming out of school have trouble with because they don't necessarily have the big projects that are going to give them the data to show results and impact. Ooh, so you, you're doing work but you don't get the data to know how impactful your work actually was for the order. Yeah, so sometimes like students are doing like, like they're doing internship work and sometimes mm-hmm. it doesn't get launched or they're only um, at a company for a very short amount of time mm-hmm. and they leave and whatever they've worked on doesn't get launched or maybe it does get launched, um, but they never follow up to get the data mm-hmm. uh, about how, how well their designs did. Yeah. So I didn't have enough impact um, and it was evident that I didn't. I didn't have... Uh, like click through rates or anything like that, or um, I didn't do a ton of like UX research because mm-hmm. I was strictly focused on design and like building those chops. Um, so yeah, the first interview was not great because they couldn't tell if I was impactful or not. And Amazon is all about being impactful. So you said something that I think is fire, and I want to make sure people caught this. So even though you bombed the interview, they still recognize you as you said a culture fit. Mm-hmm. So now it's, it's interesting because we always hear companies say like, oh, okay, this person's a good culture fit. Are you a good culture fit? And one of the things I even talk to our community about often is, hey, the companies usually what they want is usually a combination of two things. They want to make sure you have the knowledge that they're looking for and they want to make sure that you're a good culture fit. Those are usually the, the main two uh, that they are looking for. And usually we, we, we see people get the job because, okay, they got the technical knowledge down and we've seen people lose out on the job because of that. And maybe not even technical knowledge, but the way they're able to communicate it. Like you mentioned before, you not having those metrics to prove the work that you had did for Under Armour or for, uh, well, not group me because you weren't a UX designer at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but never have I ever heard someone that was such a good culture fit, but bombed <laughs> the other stuff. But the culture fit part fits so well mm. that the company really was like, no, we're going to hold on to your information and we're going to tap you on the shoulder later on in the future. So what would you say, just a word of advice, I know people are listening to this and they're like, okay, like, okay, how do I be a good culture fit? How do I be <laughs> such a good culture fit mm. that even if I'm not necessarily the best candidate for whatever technical or, or metrics they're looking for, how am I still such a great culture fit that they still want me? Yeah. So, so just being able, I think to learn and prove that you made mistakes and you learned from those mistakes. So they want to know that there's some learnings that you took from every project. Um, having great collaboration with people that are outside of your functional skills. So Mm -hmm. it could be PMs, it could be devs. Um, I had worked with a lot of developers before, so Mm -hmm. I was very familiar with their process. Um, and I love working with developers. It's, it's exciting. It really is to see what they're building and sort of how they think it's, it's, it's wild. (laughs) Does that help you better in in your role? It does because they bring to the table, the technical knowledge to tell me what can and can't be done. Okay. So, if something can't be done, it forces you because of those constraints, it forces you to be more creative. Mm, so yeah. when you're forced in, into sort of like thinking, OK, I can do A, B and C, but not D, you have to creatively come up with a way to fit D in there yeah. without relying on the deaf side. That makes sense. I used to be a spoken word artist and I was I actually was doing it full time for about five years. And that's all I was doing mm-hmm. and was I was very broke, but I was making enough to, to pay the bills and think I was, you know, doing good off of it. But anyway, I remember one of the most frustrating things was when I got booked to write on a topic, but they didn't give me a lot of constraints when they made it too broad. Yep. It frustrated me yep. because I couldn't. I was like, man, I just I was like, OK, what well, they said, yeah, just write up, write about love. And I'm like. Like, what is that? You know, or write about God. I'm like, uh, okay. I'm like, can you tell me themes of your event that I can mention? Can Mm -hmm. you tell me, okay, what's the demographic? Can Okay. Like, like give me some constraints because yeah, like you mentioned, it's something about constraints that it really 
forces yep. creative juices and things to come out. And I, I low-key think that's a bit of a metaphor for the constraints that sometimes we have like felt and we've endured mm-hmm. just in this world in general where mm-hmm. it, it's forced us to be so creative and so innovative in different ways. Right. Uh, but that's a whole different sidebar. But <laughs> anyway, please continue on. You were sharing, you were kind of breaking down different ways of how someone could be a, a culture fit right, uh, for right. a company to be able to leverage that to be able to land the role. Right, right. So I had really good, I mean, you can, everyone can look up Amazon's question bank online. Like, that's not a secret. Um, mm-hmm. And you could also look up the leadership principles. So mm-hmm. I had some really good scenarios during my interview that really like told the interviewer, okay, this is a cultural fit for us. Yeah. Even though she might not be ready where she is in her technical skills or she might not show impact yet, she's still a good cultural fit. So yeah. I was able to really ace that part of the interview enough to be recycled. So, okay. yeah. And I, you know, and I was down about not getting it the first time because mm-hmm. on it, like I thought I had rocked the interview. Like mm-hmm. I, was, I was amazing. I thought all these things. And then I got the call that I didn't get the job. <laughs> Man. So, and yeah. So why would you say you bombed it then? Not bomb necessarily. Yeah, but I, like you just fail. Like you. Yeah. yeah. I just felt like I did so well. Yeah. And they told me no. Yeah. Okay, so let that be a word of advice. Don't completely <laughs> trash the interview and think like, well, I showed up looking good and I was nice. <laughs> Still do your due diligence because you, you were doing your due diligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's interesting. You know what's funny? I actually got a role that I shouldn't have gotten where I had legit, legit like trashed the the demo part of the interview. It was the mm-hmm. final round. And they told me straight up. They said, yeah, that was not what we were expecting. <laughs> At all, Jeez. but luckily the the VP of sales of the company I had met her, so she just told them I don't care, hire him anyway. Yeah, and so um, uh, sh- shouts out to her for doing that. She shouldn't have done it because I, <laughs> <laughs> but she did it anyway. So uh, shouts out to her for that. Um, so now working in big tech comes with a lot of different perks, mm. you know, benefits, things that are really cool, and you know, especially. Things that are even uncommon, even for billion dollar tech companies, because, you know, big tech being a lot of centi, uh, centi billion dollar companies, it's other things that comes along with them. And some of those perks are beneficial, but sometimes those perks can be a setback in mm-hmm. ways that a person would get excited about it and not realize, OK, let me observe this a little bit further. What are some of the examples of big tech perks and risks that people should be aware of? Um, I think now the tech companies are pretty good at offering like family planning services, especially okay. for women. So if you want to do IVF, you want to freeze your eggs, um, you want to adopt, the tech companies have realized that they need to offer these services to their employees. Wow, I did not even know so this. So now, you know, a, a lot of those costs, it's really expensive to adopt. And so a lot of the costs are now covered. Um, so I would say that's a huge, huge perk and an yeah. incentive for women to be in tech. Um, and to feel like their personal life is also going to be okay yeah. being in tech. Like mm-hmm. you don't have to sacrifice or putting off not having kids if you want kids. You can do that. And yeah. the tech companies will help you um, on the health front. Um, I think, I think uh, once you do get into a big tech company, you start making all this money. Mm-hmm. Of course, you, you need someone to either help you manage it or mm-hmm. you need an advisor or you just need to be money savvy. Yeah. And there's a lot of people out there that want want to help Mm -hmm. that may not necessarily be helpful for you. So um, financial advisors and wealth managers, um, I think they're great if you really have a lot of assets and you have a need for that, but a lot of the research you can do on your own. You don't Mm -hmm. have to pay someone to do that. So um, if you like log into Fidelity, you can change up your portfolio based on your like long-term financial goals. So you can do that yourself. You don't need to pay someone for that. Um, So I think I fell into that trap early on Mm -hmm. because I thought I needed that. Um, and then I realized I didn't. Yo, so for everybody that's interested in what this guest is talking about and you will love a similar career, I suggest you check out Course Careers Bootcamp. Course Careers is a bootcamp that I have been partnered with for well over a year now, and they have helped more people break into tech, I'll be honest, than any other bootcamp that I've personally seen. So look, Course Careers is only 500 bucks, that's it. But if you use our discount code, Cyrus50, you'll get an additional $50 off. So that way all you pay is actually $449. That's it. No additional price later, no extra cost, extra fees. That's it with the price for course careers. Now they're a self-paced bootcamp that you can take and be able to get a variety of different roles in tech. So make sure you check them out. Use our link below in that discount code if you want an additional $50 off and keep us posted on your journey breaking into tech. 
So, so you fell into a trap with a wealth manager, and, it, and you would share with me offline. It, it wasn't that what they were doing was necessarily bad. It was just you realized, okay, it could have been better. Yeah. So yeah. their their job is really to educate you and um, not necessarily make recommendations, but ask you what your goals are and see if there are products that fit yeah. for your goals. Um, I do have one now that's that's great. Been with me since since I lived in Seattle. Um, mm-hmm. They're amazing. But I just I would pick that very cautiously because you yeah. don't have to have that. You can do your, all your own research. You can put your funds where you need to, depending on your goals. There's tools online that you can get into and sort of research yourself. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So that's, that's really good. What is a word of advice you would get? So let's say someone's listening and let me, let me know in the comments, like if you all are listening, you're thinking, okay, yo, I would love to have like some type of financial advisor or wealth manager, you know, once I'm, you know, making X amount of dollars or once I'm in a certain space, of course, some people will think, oh, well, I can manage my money fine when they're making 40, 50,000, but it's like, it's a whole different ballpark when mm-hmm. you're, you know, at another space. But also I'll say there are people that at 40, $50,000, I've seen people do an amazing job of managing their money. Yeah. Where I'm like, man, you, you, you handling that money good. Mm-hmm. And usually those people that continue on once they're at the 200, $300,000 mark, they continue with those habits. They're doing yeah. a phenomenal job as well. But let me know in the comments, if you think you would want to go with like a wealth manager or financial uh, advisor at all, what is, now, for the person that says, hey, you know what? I would really benefit from having some type of financial advisor. Maybe mm-hmm. like a person who they themselves are like, okay, I know I need to go to the gym, but I'm going to need a personal <laughs> trainer to kind of keep me accountable. Mm-hmm. A financial advisor, a wealth manager being kind of the same type of uh, role. What are a few things you would say for them to look out for to make sure that they are getting the, the best bang for their buck? Um, I would just say keep an eye on the fees because okay. if you like take out a life insurance policy with um, a financial advisor or an institution, there's going to be some fees involved in that and just make sure you're not paying more than you should. So just mm-hmm. if they're taking out fees on a quarterly basis, make sure you're logging in and just keeping an eye on those fees because they can over time add up. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> interesting. I mean, that's important. That's important to know. Now, I saw a post that said it's easier to build a six figure business than it is to make six figures working a nine to five. And now you've been working and you've been working in tech and you've been making six figures in tech for a while and you are a business owner. In your opinion, which is harder? You know, is it harder, you know, to work a job in tech and be able to do that or working and building out a business? And also, does working in tech, do you feel like it's slowed down the the opportunity that your business has, or do you feel that it's been beneficial to your business? I personally, just at this point in my in my life, think that owning a business is harder because I haven't owned a business before. So I'm having mm-hmm. to make adjustments to my lifestyle yeah. so that I can run this business to where it grows. Yeah. Right? Like instead of um, going out on the weekends and just having drinks. Yeah. Sometimes I now find myself at home working mm-hmm. on the business. So it's a lifestyle adjustment yeah. and I'm accountable to myself. And so I have to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that, I mean, it, it tech, it tech is hard too. Tech yeah. is not a walk in the park. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard. Um, but I think the more seasoned you get, the more confident you are in your knowledge yeah. and your abilities. And so when things happen in tech and things don't go your way, um, it, you know, you, you build up this resilience and I think I've built that resilience up enough where mm-hmm. I can sort of tolerate anything that happens at work. Mm-hmm. But now I'm trying to shift my focus to, okay, I have this business. I want it to grow and succeed. Mm-hmm. I need to just cut back on some of the personal things. It's it's a lifestyle change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And how has working in tech, you know, because obviously we, we, we can kind of look at the financial piece and you can still touch on that if you want to. But mm-hmm. how has working in tech, specifically big tech, maybe Amazon, really shaped you into being a better business owner or being more driven? Yeah, I have processes in place now because yeah. I hold myself accountable. So mm-hmm. I don't think I would have 
been this process driven had I not been in tech all these years. Okay. Um, and I have milestones for the business and I yeah. do what's called like a work back schedule, which is a very tech thing to do, but I do it for my business as well so that I know that I'm hitting these goals on a monthly basis. What is a work back schedule? It's basically like six months out. Um, this is where I want to be. This is what I need to do. And then oh, yeah. four so you months. look at your goals mm-hmm. and then you pull back. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I pull back so I can get a whole picture of like, how am I going to get there? Yeah. Um, and I have to do that to hold myself accountable. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I don't know. <laughs> I'd be out hanging out with friends, you know? You know, it's really cool because, like, what you're saying, it's, it's interesting because even though you are a relatively new business owner, the things you're talking about are <laughs> things that very seasoned business owners talk about. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with a Social Proof podcast by David Shins. No. So David Shins, really amazing podcast. You definitely should check it out. And he's a... He, he interviews business owners, entrepreneurs that are, I mean, they're all doing pretty well, you know, mm-hmm. and various business spaces. And uh, like any of the influencers, successful people that are business owners that you've seen, they've more than likely been on his podcast. Mm-hmm. And he started a new segment that's pretty interesting where he's interviewing business owners that are new business owners that don't have certain systems and things in place. But of course, they're saying like, oh yeah, we're successful. We got our stuff together. So it's like a hot seat. So they sit in a hot seat and he questions things about their business. And when I tell you, it's a wow. hot seat. <laughs> like wow. it's, and every person gets exposed where he's like, you know, for instance, he asked one guy about, I think his SOPs or, uh, no, he asked what CRM are using. He said, what CRM are using? And the guy was like, oh, I mean, yeah, you know, we're using Shopify. And it's like, it was like, what? That's not a CRM. But and then he, oh, he literally said to the dude, he said, just say you don't know what a CRM is. Yeah. And the guy was like, I know what a CRM. He was like, dude, you don't know what a CRM is. And so he really calls the people yeah, out of there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as he should, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's not to embarrass people. It's really holding them accountable. You yeah. know, he asked the girl, hey, what's your marketing strategy? And she was like, oh, well, no, it started off him saying, like, your marketing strategy is posting on social media. She was like, no, 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 we have a marketing strategy. He said, what's your marketing strategy? And then as she explained, it was, okay, your marketing strategy is just posting on social media. <laughs> and But it's it's really helpful and beautiful for a lot of... There have been a couple of people where they said, you know what, I, they were sitting there, they're like, I don't think I should be a business owner Like after having this conversation. Mm. So it's very sobering and beautiful, but listening to you mention the things you're doing within your business, <laughs> I'm like, those are things that a lot of business owners... There are a lot of business owners that don't even start doing it until after they're doing seven figures. Mm. Like, seriously. And, and that's a super common thing. Super wow. common. So, I really want to say that really to give you your flowers, what it is that you're doing, where I know you're like, okay, I'm, I'm a you know relatively new business owner, mm-hmm. but it's like the, the, the knowledge that you... The things that you're doing are are huge they're huge (laughs) and so that's incredible and i really hope that y'all listen to what she said she's doing and that those of you that are aspiring business owners or you are business owners already that you like look into some of the things that she mentioned that she's doing because it's things that will allow you to grow faster and smoother and will give you a broader and better perspective about your goals overall so thank you so much uh for sharing that yeah really appreciate that (laughs) all right so now, what are some unexpected challenges that new business owners and non-social media people have to deal with when going that direction? Yeah, I think building awareness mm-hmm. um, is a big one. And you can use multiple tools to do that, but it has to be consistent. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I struggle with because sometimes I'll do posting. Sometimes I do ads. I'll run a few ads and then I'll retarget the people who stop by the website Um, but building awareness is tough, um, especially when you're doing it by yourself. So I am considering hiring someone to help me with that. Um, because I, I can't do everything. Even if I think I can, I, I know I can't. (laughs) So, um, so I think that, and, um, if you're doing anything where you're importing into the U S oh my God, let me tell you the process is horrible. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you were talking to me about that a yeah, little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so what just, is that process like? Well, because I, because of the volume of um, swimmer that I imported, mm-hmm. I was hit with a, a, a tax, basically. And um, wait, wait, a tax? I don't think I remember that part. A yeah, tax like or, how? Or a fee. It's it's oh, a fee. Oh, a tax. I'm, I'm yeah. attacked like a cyber security. Oh, like no, no, no. I'm like, what in the world? You got ops out here trying to do? Okay, tax, cool. No. So hit with a tax. Okay, a tax. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had no awareness of that whatsoever. Yeah. I just 
I just didn't realize it. No yeah. one ever told me about it. I found out from uh, the manufacturer and they weren't even sure what the fee was going to be. Um, so it wasn't until I got all of my shipment. I had 18 boxes of swimwear sitting at uh, customs waiting for me to pay this fee so that they could release the shipment to me and then it would be on its way. So I, I just, no idea. So I'm scrambling to find all this money <laughs> so I could pay to, to get my product. How much was um, it? It's $19,000. Nineteen thousand yeah. dollars. Yes, it was to, bad to to attack. So that's on top of what you already paid. Oh yeah, just just to be. So you're thinking, okay, business wise, okay, cool. All right, I'm budgeting. I'm looking. Okay, this is how much it's mm -hmm. gonna cost me to get this merch, right? To get it here to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. This is what it is. I'm gonna set this aside, and then all of a sudden, surprise, surprise, right? right. <laughs> right. Surprise, surprise, right? There, there goes my vacation yes. in the summer. <laughs> Ninth, like yeah, nineteenth. Like that's not. I don't care how much money you have. Yeah. That's a lot. It's of money. not pocket change, and <laughs> on yeah. top of paying for the shipper to ship the stuff, I was hit with that. And then I was hit with another fee that UPS has, um, which is basically them representing you at the border. So, yeah. <laughs> and this is what you learn being a new business owner. This is the things that you learn that you just don't know about. No one told me about this. Had I known, I would have definitely either um, not imported as much yeah, um, or just went with a different manufacturer that would allow me to create a little, a little tiny bit of a fraction of what I actually created. Yeah. So what did you do? I paid the money. <laughs> you just had to. I you had know, to. as much as that, as much as that kind of hurts, at the same time, what a flex. <laughs> like, let me know in the comments if y'all agree or y'all again, that hurts. But imagine being able to say, oh, I got hit with a surprise nineteen thousand dollar charge plus another charge. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, dang. Let me right. handle that. Boom. <laughs> oh, that's a flex. That, that's, that, that is a flex. It hurt. And, and it so, still hurts. It oh, still yeah. hurts. That hurt me. And that wasn't even me. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> but uh, so you were able to, and, and that, that was all from your, your income working at Amazon. Yeah. So... My day job has really allowed me to start this business. Yeah. And like, I don't recommend anyone quitting a job to start a business. <laughs> it's the worst thing you can do. You need something that is more of a safety net um, mm -hmm. when you're starting a business. And for me, um, Amazon has allowed me to do that. You know, yeah. it allowed me to sort of say, hey, I want to do something different with my time uh, on the side. And hey, I have a, I have a business. You know, the... the I'm not gonna say this would never happen, but I could never see this happening. As much as we talk about, you know, these tech companies doing things like, hey, providing us with laptops covering our Wi Fi and mm -hmm. examples you gave about, you know, like we also know about the education stipend, you know, they'll uh, pay for us further in our education, mm -hmm. specifically when it matters. And then also you mentioning them, you know, paying for helping, you know, a woman freeze her eggs or yeah. she want, you know, wanting to adopt and all these things are cool. How dope would it be if the companies are like, hey, you know what? We're going to help fund or help you start your business or be like a small investor right. in your business. Mm -hmm. Almost as if you could go to your tech company and say, hey, look, I've been here for four years, eight years, 10 years. Here's my business plan. It lines up with kind of what the company wants to do, kind of like an entrepreneurship type of thing. Like, mm -hmm. hey, I can build out this business and the company can be an investor in this and be a part owner and blah, blah, blah. That would actually be a really cool thing. That'd be great. Yeah. But I, no. Yeah, no, I, have, I, know, I know. It's like a la la land type thing, of thing. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that would be cool. So, but no, that, that is really um, Im impressive that you're able to do that. And it, it's beautiful that you're able to do that as well. Because, I mean, man, I, I, it literally would have been a bit of a dream killer right away mm -hmm. if starting out. Uh, I, there, one of my favorite podcasts is called How I Built This. I used to listen to it when I was yep. live driving. Yeah, yep. you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if yep. for those of y'all that are in the tech space, it's actually a popular podcast that a lot of techies uh, listen to and are familiar with. But I remember hearing so many episodes where, you know, always at the beginning, the way that they do the story of the podcast is so clever and beautiful. Yeah. And I love how you hear with many of the interviews, there being like a crucible moment where it's like, yo, that could have been the make or break for the person. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. 
of course, there are going to be multiple crucibles that we have to go through as we're growing and building businesses. But I hear that and I'm like, man, that was a bit of a crucible moment where, yeah. you know, had you not had what you have with Amazon that, you know, it would have been a really tough, maybe maybe you would have had to go into the bank. You would have had to do something else that yeah. really would have put you in a, in a tight position. Yeah. And so, uh, so I'm happy that you didn't have to go into debt in order to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. So now you are the founder of Mahogany Coast Swim. I'm going to throw myself under the bus. Here we go. Oh, I'm about to throw myself <laughs> under the bus. I love it. Here we I, go. I was actually hoping Eric wasn't going to be in here when I was going to share this story. Because when you were out there, I was thinking like, good, Eric isn't going to be in here for this part of the interview. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, you would have saw it later. When you you would have been editing a little bit like, what? Okay, listen. All right, I'm throwing myself under the bus here. So, look. So, I mentioned doing a street style interview. When we first connected, I mentioned doing a street style interview with you. Mm -hmm. And y'all know the street style interviews is not like the podcast. It's when I'm holding up the mic, asking someone, what do they do in tech? Things like that. And I had a suggestion when I was like, oh, okay, you're the founder of Mahogany Coast Swim. I said, hey, we should do a street interview talking about your job in tech, but also talking about Mahogany Coast Swim. And I said, and I got a genius idea. <laughs> we should do it when you're wearing your bikini <laughs> so people can see. <laughs> so, oh, <man. laughs> He did. He did. <laughs> this is what you said. You did you were just talking about, I guess, with a profile picture? A profile picture? Uh, the cover picture. A cover picture? Oh, no, 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 no. That was something else. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other time I, I bombed and, you know, it made a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so um, I, was, I said, hey, you should wear your bikini. Of course, my mindset is thinking... Uh, I'm thinking two things. I'm thinking one. I said, let's be real. I'm thinking like, oh, it'll it'll you know draw more eyeballs. People stop and be like, oh, it's a woman in a bikini. You know, has a lovely shape. Let me stop. And then I'm like, two. I said, <laughs> Eric, Eric is, is Eric is making this worse in the background. <laughs> but I'm like, yo, okay, people are gonna stop, and I'm like, yo, people are gonna stop, and they're gonna hear about what she's doing in tech, and they're gonna be like, wow, they're gonna be inspired, so it's gonna help a lot of people. And I say, but also it'll help promote the swim line because people will see the swim line and see what it looks like. That's what I'm thinking. But then <laughs> your response, you were like record scratch. You're like, uh, no, <laughs> no. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah I was like, like no. no. Uh, yeah, we, we ain't doing that. He was like, I'm going to dress in a regular... I'm going to dress how I dress. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about the swim line. Right. Or whatever. <laughs> right. And, um... Yeah, I don't know you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, dude, you just trying to see me in a bikini. <laughs> That's what you're trying to do. <laughs> That's hilarious. Right. <laughs> If you're looking to break into tech, scale in your tech career, or get networking, collaboration, resources, and more, I have something huge for you. Tech is a New Black is the largest tech career platform in the world. We've helped over a thousand people break into six-figure tech careers and even more scale. But now we're taking it even further with our Techpreneur Discord community. This community offers high-level networking and collaboration with tech leaders, tech recruiters, and more through events, private streams, and daily group conversations. And if you're looking to break into tech, we don't just have all of the trainings and resources that you need, but we actually have partnerships with different companies that are hiring from within our community. So no matter your goal and your career income or business, the Techpreneur community was made for you. Just hit the link in the description to join. So now what I thought was really interesting with this is you declined it because you did not want your professional brand or your swimmer line to be given that kind of image. Mm -hmm. Now, in an era of OnlyFans and City Girls, why do you choose to not go the easy route with promoting your brand? I just don't think that's my brand. Yeah. Like, that's not me as a person, and I represent my brand. And to me, being sexy is not showing everything. Yeah. Being sexy is what you don't see. Mm -hmm. um, so I prefer not to you know, go those routes only because yeah, it's going to tarnish my professional brand. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I still have a, a day job <laughs> yeah. and, um, I, it's just never been me, yeah. you know, and, and no knock to people that do that yeah, and I want to do not. that. That's, that's, on, that's on them and yeah. how they make their money is their business. Um, but for me, I want to attract an audience of women that are professional mm -hmm. that want to look good, but also want to be comfortable on yeah. the beach or a pool or wherever they are. Um, and then 
give them the confidence that they can wear the suit and not have everybody like gawking at them all the time or mm -hmm. they can wear the suit and they can still be beautiful and sexy but they're not having everything out and exposed yeah you know yeah, I think that's that's really incredible because I mean I've seen your your swim line and it's it looks nice like the stuff is is really is really cool and, and it still is attractive so I want to be clear definitely go and check it out we'll have it linked in the show notes still very still very attractive looking swimwear but like you mentioned it's not something where it's like yo everything is just out there right where it's like yo that's another level of boldness that some people have to wear that <laughs> right. stuff where I'm like yeah. like where's I feel uncomfortable I'm like yo I feel uncomfortable <laughs> right now. You know, and so uh, so I love that you, that you do that because that is something that's different. And I think that's really interesting for for people that, again, are, are business owners, because oftentimes some people would think, OK, well, I can't create a, a certain type of business because that business is already out there. But oftentimes people don't realize, hey, you can just you can have the same business, but have a different target audience mm -hmm. that you're going to reach. Mm -hmm. And then many times people are thinking, OK, well. How do I find that target audience? And it's like, well, okay, do you see something in the space that you feel doesn't fit you? And you're like, okay, this is way too skimpy. These things over here, you know, make me look like a grandma, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, what is something that's that's in like a white space? And yeah. so there's nothing in the white space. That means maybe I'm meant to fill that white space. Right. And so I love and support so much what it is you're doing. Like you mentioned, no shade towards anyone else and what it is that they're doing. Nevertheless, just going a different route a different path mm -hmm. to to build something i think is really incredible and honestly i think that's courageous today yeah and so uh definitely big ups to you again make sure y'all check out um check out the the line y'all know it's a it's springtime coming up summertime <laughs> coming up that's right so <laughs> ria's ridiculous <laughs> she rubbing her hands together bird man style <laughs> okay i can't like stop it <laughs> Erica and Rhea are cutting up in the background, y'all. All right, so... All right, now we talked about this a bit. I mean, there's honestly a few things we talked about. Yeah. And I was like, man, I wish we had so much more time for this conversation. Because when I was having to trim down things and, and kind of refine what we were going to talk about, I was like, oh, man, there's so many things I want to talk about. But how can women with a traditionally... What's seen as a traditionally masculine drive and high-level corporate success still maintain their softness and their femininity in both life and in dating? Oh, geez. This this is a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> this is a hard yeah, question. That's why we, we brought it to the Yeah, the, bring it to the table. To answer, yeah. um, <laughs> well, I remember when we talked, you, you asked me something along the lines of, did you always set out to be a boss? Yeah. Or a boss girl a or boss something babe. like that. A boss babe. Boss babe. Yeah, boss, boss babe. babe. <laughs> um, and then my response to that was, I just set out to give myself financial freedom mm -hmm. and to do what I want to do. Yeah. And I think sort of people thinking you're a boss just is a byproduct of that, right? Mm, okay. So I didn't set out to be like a certain type of girl or anything like that. I just yeah. wanted financial freedom. I wanted yeah. uh, fulfillment in my life and my job. And the business has given me that because it's given me a different avenue of creativity, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but <sighs> women get thrown so much today. Yeah. Like in the, in the job, you know, in meetings, we, we get thrown a lot our way. And it is hard to not fall for that and not take the bait. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, I would say just making sure whatever happens to you in your life, whether it's good, bad, um, you're going to go through some heartbreaks, you're going to go through a lot of stuff. Yeah. Just being authentic to your core is going to mm -hmm. help you maintain that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, all over the Internet, there's all these, you know, things about relationships and toxicity and all this yeah. other stuff. A lot of gender war stuff going on. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of gender war stuff and we need to stop that, especially yeah. the black community. We need to stop that. Yeah, we definitely. need to stop being at war with each other. We all need therapy. I highly recommend therapy. Everybody on this planet needs therapy because mm -hmm. we all have some sort of trauma from childhood or you know just life in general that we need to get out of our system. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is not in your relationship with your partner, but it's in therapy. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend therapy for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, but the black community is so torn right now and it breaks my heart because we don't need to do that yeah. to each other. You know, we need to be lifting each other up and supporting each other and not competing. I see a lot of yeah. men and women competing against each other and it's sad. It's unnecessary. Um, I love being a woman. I love my femininity. 
Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's amazing to wake up in this body every day. Like I thank God for that, you yeah. know? Um, so there's no need to compete with men. There mm-hmm. isn't, you know, um, I think a woman's presence holds its own weight in a room. Yeah, definitely. And especially when you see a black woman at a table and it's mostly white men or white colleagues that, that speaks volumes. That is powerful enough that you don't have to go the extra length to prove yourself. Yeah. Just you being in the room, you've proven it already. I was in Dallas yesterday for the uh, tech event that I was hosting at. And one of the speakers at the event is uh, Kayla Burks. Uh, she was a guest on the podcast before. Um, are you familiar with Kayla Burks? No, I'm not, actually. Oh, I have to introduce y'all <laughs> sometime in the future. Like, you, you would like, like, y'all would like each other so much. Uh, Kayla... She's at Microsoft. Okay. And for it was either at yeah, it was at Microsoft. There was she received an award for being the top. So she's in tech sales. She's an enterprise account executive. A young black woman, very big on her femininity, all those things. She won an award at Microsoft for being the top. She was number three in sales at Microsoft. Wow. Huge. Wow. Because the number of of tech sales people that they have mm-hmm. and the the level of work that goes into that to hit those metrics and those numbers is insane. Mm-hmm. And I knew that about her already. She was a guest on the podcast as I mentioned before. And was, I was like, okay, you could, you could tell certain things about her. She was living out here in Atlanta. She recently moved to Dallas and I was watching her move around here in Atlanta and I was watching dudes basically try to shoot their shot at her. Guys that were like plotting, being like, who is, because they saw when I posted her on the podcast, mm. they were like, yo, Cyrus, who is that? It was like, shit, that's a tech baddie. I'm, I'm a getter. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, I didn't know her. And I was like, okay, well, aside from her being on the show. And then guys were like plotting, plotting. And it was just, nobody was getting anywhere. And you know, it's funny because because when, when guys are plotting and not with good intentions, you can tell when like it's not going their way because they pretend like they just lost interest and it's like no nah, playboy she just, she just wasn't giving you no play <laughs> they was like yeah you know I just mean I, it's like yeah no she wouldn't give you no play like she saw it through your BS and she moved to Dallas and um, after the event yesterday a group of us were hanging out and I was listening to her talk and she was talking about what she's doing there in Dallas and the networking and she was talking about the money that's there and the things she's doing and I was just sitting there and look I should have told her this I'm actually gonna make sure that. Uh, that I, I share this with her. I was sitting, I was like, man, I'm so impressed by this woman. Like, I'm so impressed by her because it's like just in all of her f- like flourishing, thriving femininity, sh- she embodies that. Like she says, like, yo, I use my femininity to be successful. Yeah. And she's like, it, it's a superpower. Mm-hmm. And I see stuff like that and I'm like, man, I love that so much. Like I love seeing, and mind you, let's let's be real, like, you know, everything isn't a complete blank slate. There are some women that don't embody natural traditional femininity look but they still are women they still are feminine mm-hmm. you know so i want to be very clear about that not paint a picture of oh if you're not like this then you are not feminine at all right yeah nevertheless i just love seeing women be women in 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 a way that makes them feel soft and mm-hmm. them feel pretty and them feel like comfortable and fully themselves right and still, like we mentioned before, within those limitations, being creative mm. and how to be successful and how to thrive. Right. So instead of being like, yo, right. okay, I'm just going to have to go fully in the route of the exact same way that a guy does things, mm-hmm. be like, no, let me allow like God to allow my my creativity to flourish within this this within this body this mind this biology of who i am as a woman Mm -hmm. and i think it's it's the coolest thing ever and (laughs) and and i say that to say that so far i see the same elements within you Mm. and it's just been so dope and just even this brief time getting to know each other appreciate you so much for being on the podcast just the the (laughs) gems and things you've dropped what would you express to to everybody, men and women, people who, who see what you've done, and you can speak directly to the women if you want to. It's really uh, up to you. But what would you express for people that are watching you and they're listening? They're like, man, mm-hmm. yo, I look at what she's been doing. I mean, you, you haven't just, you know, you've been at Amazon for a while and you have been moving up through the ranks. You've been doing some incredible, incredible <laughs> things. What would you share with people that you believe could really give them? Because this, this interview I know has inspired them, but what can you give them a gem or a nugget that you believe will really help them? 
I think you always have to advocate for yourself. No one mm-hmm. else is going to do that. You can't sit around and wait for the promotion. You have to make that promotion happen. Yeah. Um, and that's something I think early in my career, I was just kind of sitting back being like, oh, I did all these things. Now you should recognize me. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to do that. You, yeah. you actually have to make that happen for yourself mm-hmm. uh, and you have to advocate for yourself. So I think women don't advocate um, for themselves as much as, as men do. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. We kind of just, you know, sit back and, mm-hmm. you know, we, we work hard and, and then we don't get recognized for it. But you yeah. have to be, be up front and center and advocate for everything that you do. Yeah. Um, and I would also say, like, you know, leadership is about being seen more mm-hmm. so than doing all the work on time, making all the deadlines. Yeah. Um, if you're seen you will get much, much farther than if you're just going to put your head down and work, work, work all the time. Wow. Yeah. You have to be seen. 